This is by far the oldest professional video monitor CRT that I've ever had the chance to work on. This is an Ikigami monitor uh, from 1987 and it's a pro monitor. It does do RGB as well as other standard video inputs. But I wanted to go ahead and get it on film because I've just fired it up to start looking at it to restore and uh, we have kind of a weak screen on here and it has been flickering a little bit which is a telltale sign that the capacitors inside really really need to be replaced especially the ones that are controlling the power and so we'll get those changed and also I've got a lot of crazy distortion down here in the corner and up here at the corners and edges it's flickering too if I don't know if you can see it on there I'm trying to make it show up but even though I knock on the screen it, it makes it shudder and that really shouldn't happen normally that's probably a sign that again those capacitors have gone bad let's see what it's going to take to get this monitor working again I know it's going to at least be a capacitor kit but it might be even more the first thing I'm going to do is remove the outer shell which I've done and now I'm just going to plug it in and we're going to do an initial test run to see what happens when we power it on for the first time. I'm going to turn this monitor on now and try to listen to this transformer. And that sound's coming from that large yellow transformer right down there. Before you discharge, make sure that your monitor is not plugged in or anything, but let's just get that cap up there. You can see the metal. All right, here's the board laid out for the first time, and we're gonna take a look at it. It's got a lot of electrolytic capacitors that we'll be changing, as well as a boatload of potentiometers, these little green and white potentiometers. That's actually how we're gonna control our screen picture, our geometry, as well as probably our color, brightness, and other things. This is the power supply area where a lot of that noise was coming from. So we're gonna need to replace every capacitor in here for sure. Look at the bottom of the board. This is a pretty easy to work on board since it's not dual layered. There's no components underneath it. So it's a little easier to work on. All right, here we are in this Ikigami. Here's the full board. I've removed all the capacitors that I'm changing, which is everyone around this heat sink, obviously, okay? See all these very large capacitors. This is my power part of my board. And then there's a couple along the outside of this shielding that I removed that were just up along here. Uh, I did not remove these because I don't feel like these are going to have any effect over geometry and they're not in the hotter areas. I'm not replacing every single cap. Uh, now if you look over here at this section of the board, this is my geometry area. So I definitely removed every single capacitor in there and I'm changing and replacing them. Again, to do this properly, I removed each capacitor and I recorded the little number that's next to them. I recorded the value because I could not find the list of capacitors from a manual or anything for this older Ikigami. There's one more thing I wanted to show you. So I was looking at um, my monitor while I was basically repairing it. And this connector right here is where my yoke controls go in. And one of the connection points on there has burned straight out. Look at the bottom of the board and see right here. It's just nasty and crusty and just worthless, destroyed. So that was like that prior to me uh, repairing this. It was barely hanging on, uh, barely connection, any connection at all right there. So thankfully that just comes down here to this point. So for now I'm going to uh, bypass that whole spot and just connect that green cable up to the connection point where it will connect ultimately to my yoke and hopefully that won't cause any other issues and one more thing i did have to do on this older board was i went through and reflowed solder 
on all my portions of the, or this portion of the board, you can almost tell where I've still got some flux that hasn't been cleaned off yet and where the fresh solder is, especially in the higher heat areas and um, all this power supply area. I definitely reflowed the solder on that. There was a lot of other connections up here that just looked bad. So that's something you have to do with an older board. Again, this one's from the mid 80s. So you're definitely going to need to check to see if any cold solder joints have developed. I hope not to have to resolder or reflow the solder on the entire board, but ultimately that might have to be done. One more thing I want to go over real quickly before I start installing the new caps. I often get asked uh, to cover this and I forget it sometimes, so I want to talk about it for a second. And that's the temperature that I want to use on my dec or on my soldering iron to replace the uh, capacitors with new ones. Now, of course, I'll be using my HACO, and it's got a nice control uh, unit on the front that lets me control the, the temperature. And you don't want to go too hot um, on something like this, because if you go too hot, you'll burn the connections and the pads off the board. They're just, they're not... Uh, they're not going to be as sturdy as they were even 20, 30 years ago. So I always try to just see what temperature I need to use, the lowest temperature I need to use to uh, reset caps or reflow solder. For this board, that was about oh, 650, between 650 and 700. Uh, sometimes you'll notice I have to go higher than that when I'm working on certain things. And... Um, but 650 is about as low as I've gone before and had to use. So just remember that you need to match the heat with whatever it takes to get the components in and out. You don't want to use too much heat. Here's a look at the cap kit. Just tons and tons of capacitors. I get some special order, very large uh, capacitors. And I'm just going to go now and solder all these back into place. And I'll update you once we have it finished. Two hours later. Well, that was actually quite a bit of work, and I just want to go over some cautions for you. If you ever work on a board that is this old, and understand that this stuff from the late 80s, the problem with a lot of these things when you get into working on them is you have to be extra careful or you can uh, damage other components just by tapping them, moving them, uh, trying to install stuff. So you really have to take your time and it's 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 a uh, it's not an uh, easy task really you, you just have to take a lot of extra time and make sure that you're concentrating on everything that you're installing this total cap replacement job was uh, 37 in all probably took me about not quite two hours to do it and again that includes checking it and everything uh, but there's a lot of areas on here where little components can just even be moved and ground out against each other. And that, I'm sure that would cause an issue on the screen too. A lot of these uh, lifted resistors in place and things, they're, they're all over the board and they can easily bend and tap against each other with live metal. And um, I'm sure that would cause an issue. Another problem I had was this is a single sided board and some of the, some of the areas on here, even is no matter how careful I was, part of the pad would actually lift up. I don't believe I have anything that didn't. I wasn't able to get connected. The good news is with a single-sided board like this, it's very simple to run a trace. And I don't believe, it, it looks like everything matched. And you can always test for continuity you know, with a multimeter to make sure that you're not uh, having an open gap on any of these connections. But that's pretty much it. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time cleaning this board anymore because I'm afraid I might damage it. And I really would hate to do that after I've just invested all that time and uh, money for the parts and the work to get this put back together. So right now I'm going to take this and hopefully I can remember how to reassemble this monitor and uh, we'll get it fired up and see if, if it works still. Well, it is now time to do the unthinkable and test this monitor out. Are you ready Brutus? Well, of course you're ready. <laughs> First thing I'll plug in is the AC current. Hopefully we won't hear any pops or bangs. Okay. Now, now I'm just going to try to turn the power on. It's 
Sounds like it's powering up. We got some screen whiteness. So I've got a screen put on here, but it is so insanely bright um, that you can't even see it on the camera screen. You can barely see it if I if I take and get the brightness as low as possible. But so something. I mean, it's got the, I can see red, green, and blue on there, but something's not right where the tube's just going way too high on brightness. This doesn't have a sub-menu, so I'm going to get back into those potentiometers and keep twisting them. Uh, I just wanted to show the screen actually does turn on, but it's just in case I, you know, get back there and start working again, and I get another screen overload, and I can't get it to turn back on. So hopefully that's not the case. Um, I've also got these adjustments in here that maybe I need to work on and I'll uh, let you know how it goes. We'll check back in after I get the screen looking a little nicer. That's a little bit difficult to see right now, but the red color is not fully showing up. I can tell there's a little bit of background red. There are some red background controls that pop down here. And if I adjust, I do see some red, so I'm hoping that the red color gun is not out and burned out on this tube. But I don't think that's it. When there, there's some potentiometers towards the back of the monitor that I noticed to actually control the red, green, and blue levels. The green and blue levels, when I adjust them, you can tell on the screen. If I adjust the red, I get nothing. So I'm going to need to take it back apart and check out that area, um, that pathway along that red color line. Maybe one of the capacitors is out, is out and that's not an area that I possibly changed a cap in or uh, maybe there's something else going on. But So the next thing I have to do unfortunately is re-disassemble it and get to work on that area. Um, there's also something else that's quite interesting. I'll try to show it to you on the screen but uh, I don't know if you can see that flickering like that. So see how that kind of goes in and out too? There's, see there's some red. So. Uh, that makes me feel like the red's still working. And that's just from me grounding the points back here, but also just shows that I need to go and um, reflow all the solder on this control board. And I don't know, I might just be stuck reflowing the solder on the whole monitor uh, just because there's so many areas that just a little bit of shake can cause a distortion. All right, so great news. I disassembled the monitor again. And I found a capacitor right next to the potentiometer that controls this red. And uh, I changed the capacitor. And now I can increase that red on my screen. I, you probably can't see it here, but it works great. So now I'm going to have to go in here and obviously calibrate this screen a little bit and put the monitor back together. And then it'll be ready to run for some more tests. Hey, I spent another 45 minutes tweaking the screen using those potentiometers. And we're going to use the 240p test suite today on Super Nintendo. This is by far the best software to use to try to calibrate your screen and to test it. For example, for color, here's a color bars pattern. And then some of the other more important test grids are going to be this geometry grid, which gives you a good idea for how uniform your screen is. And then, of course, you need to check linearity. Now, linearity is a very important thing. You see these circles. You want them to try to be as round as possible. If you put it in an underscan, you could fit them in there, but there's always a linearity knob to turn on these monitors. I like to check every color gun, too, on this. Uh, that's a cool little test. But this is just a great bit of software that you need to have. Last repair I want to mention is our yoke repair. A little trace that we ran actually did work because we have no more distortion at the bottom of our screen. Now it's time to see the final results.
have it. The finished, repaired, 1987 Ikigami 14-inch monitor. This is a little limited because it only does RGB and composite. But it's still great to be able to save a monitor that has a good tube still and a lot of life left on it. Thanks again for watching Retro Tech today. I just want to take one last second to thank everybody who's already supporting this channel through Patreon. And please, if you have any interest in old technology and restoring it, you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month and get exclusive access to new content uh, before anybody else does. But it also helps me to get parts and research for saving old monitors like this. You also get an opportunity there to get repairs at a better rate and purchase any kind of technology that I might repair on the channel. However, clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel, and commenting is also a great way to help grow the channel and support retro tech. Thanks again everyone. I'll see you next time with some more retro content.